When reviewing reports of supposed encounters with strange entities, it's easy to be skeptical. However, the situation becomes more challenging when crucial witnesses can present seemingly compelling physical evidence to substantiate their claims. Such was the case in an incident which occurred in the southern United States during the early 1970s, an alleged encounter with a mysterious figure known as the Alabama Metal Man. In reported instances of extraterrestrial encounters, a common thread appears to be that there is a consistent disruption to human technology. Those involved often recount how vehicles experienced abrupt shutdowns of both electrical and mechanical systems, accompanied by widespread power failures at the location in question. Additionally, there are instances in which CCTV systems either failed to record crucial aspects of the encounter or in some cases were inexplicably damaged to an extent where footage could not be recovered. In an era of ever-evolving technology, it's noteworthy that mobile phones equipped with the ability to capture audio and visual evidence often seem to fail. Yet in the case we will be examining in this episode, the camera in possession of the main witness operated flawlessly. Rather than experiencing malfunctions, the individual involved captured a series of images illustrating what they encountered. These photographs continue to be a source of debate amongst academics and commentators, adding intrigue to the ongoing discourse surrounding the incident. The images themselves appear to depict a being adorned in a metallic suit, which seemed to grant superhuman abilities to whoever or whatever was inside it. A technology which bore no resemblance to anything known to exist at the time the photos were taken and which has failed to be replicated over half a century since the alleged encounter took place. During the latter half of 1973, Jeff Greenhaw was serving as the chief of police in the small town of Fultville which is situated in northern Alabama. On the evening of October the 17th, the 26-year-old was just getting ready to settle down for the night when his house phone unexpectedly began to ring. Apologising to his wife, Greenhaw made his way into the kitchen to take the call, only to hear a hysterical female voice sobbing on the other end of the line, which he did not recognise. Between her laboured breaths, the distressed woman demanded that the chief and his officers hurry to a field situated just outside of the town limits, where, she stated, she had just witnessed the landing of a large and unidentified craft. The field in question belonged to a local farmer by the name of Bobby Summerford. For the next few minutes, Greenhaw had done his best to try and calm the unknown caller, before eventually relenting and promising to attend the location in person. Hanging up the phone, he stayed his wife's protestations with reassurances that everything was in order, then grabbed his gun and various other items of equipment before heading out to his truck. Having alerted the officer on duty at the local police station of his intentions, the chief had then driven out of town, heading towards the field described by the woman under an ominous moonlit sky. He couldn't have known it at the time, but what he would witness in the vicinity of that field would forever change his outlook on the possibility of life beyond the stars. Upon his arrival, he spent a good 15 to 20 minutes driving around the pasture, 
but failed to find anything out of the ordinary. Deciding that he had been sent on a wild goose chase and resolving to find out the identity of the telephone prankster, he eventually began to head back home. But just as he was turning to exit the field, Greenhaw brought his truck to a sudden stop, having caught sight of something out in the darkness. Standing approximately 75 feet from his vehicle, at the end of a small gravel road, was the outline of a lone figure, which appeared to be intently watching him. Initially assuming it was the owner of the property having come out to inquire what he was doing, the police chief manoeuvred his truck, so the headlights now illuminated the entire track. As he did so, he audibly exhaled in confusion, for the observer was now fully revealed in the vehicle's high beams. It wasn't Bobby Summerford waiting there. In fact, outside of the science fiction movies he had watched growing up, it didn't look like anything he had seen before. In the years following the incident, Jeff Greenhall would describe the figure he encountered that evening as almost childlike, around four feet tall and affecting an odd simian-like gait. The figure appeared to be clad in a loose-fitting and wrinkly metallic overall, accompanied by a headpiece which seamlessly integrated with the rest of the suit. The material comprising the outer layers was remarkably shiny and polished, effortlessly reflecting the headlights being projected from his truck back towards him. Rising up out of the centre of the headpiece, there appeared to be a slim metallic antenna of some kind, similar to those found on remote control vehicles. Completely baffled and amazed by the sight before him, Greenhaw quickly reached into his glove box, taking hold of a Polaroid camera he habitually kept there. Having then alighted from the truck, he began to walk at a brisk pace towards the watching figure, shouting out a friendly greeting as he did so. When this mysterious character did not respond to his words, Greenhaw hesitated, eventually stopping in his tracks. He then proceeded to take four pictures. It was as the fourth of the Polaroid photographs was emerging from the camera's slit that the suited figure suddenly turned and began to run. For the briefest of moments, as he watched the retreating silhouette disappearing into the distance, Greenhaw had found himself too stunned to act. Its stiff and awkward movements had been visibly laboured, almost as if it had never travelled with any kind of urgency before. But somehow, and despite the fact its arms and legs did not seem to be operating in a coordinated manner, it was soon swallowed up by the looming darkness of the surrounding countryside. Shaking off his confusion, Greenhaw had been quick to re-enter his vehicle and set off in pursuit. Several minutes later, he spotted the enigmatic figure sprinting rapidly along the main highway towards the neighbouring town of Laken. Despite accelerating to close the gap, the young police chief found himself perplexed once more by the seemingly inhuman abilities of his quarry. Despite his best efforts, and having reached a speed in excess of 40 miles per hour, he was not able to gain any ground on the metallic figure, whose movements defied belief. Greenhaw later estimated that each one of the figure's strides covered at least 10 feet, and coupled with its incredible speed, it was able to traverse long distances in a surprisingly short space of time. Then, without warning, it suddenly began to change direction, leaping and bounding as it ran, reaching heights far beyond what it should have been capable of. Desperately weaving from side to side to try and match the direction taken by the strange interloper, Greenhaw found it impossible to keep his vehicle on the main highway. Several minutes later, his truck lost traction, careening into an uncontrolled skid as it veered into a neighbouring field. By the time he regained control and returned to the main highway, the mysterious figure had vanished without a trace.
Join us this week on the Bedtime Stories podcast for an exclusive story featuring Minamora's Bloody Mile, a notorious strip of land situated on Australia's southern coastline, which over the years has become the scene of many horrifying murders and mystifying deaths. Purported to be one of the most cursed areas to be found anywhere in the Antipodes, there are also legends of ghostly figures and other strange phenomena. Here's a small taster of what's in store. In 1936, another grisly discovery was made by the town's inhabitants when a badly burned man was found lying on open ground down by the Minamora River. As he still clung to life, he told rescuers that he'd had a dream in which he saw a burning house, hearing the cries of a baby emanating from somewhere inside. Forcing his way in, he'd tried to rescue the child, only for the flames to drive him back outside. A police investigation would later confirm that there was no sign of fire damage to any of the properties near to where he'd been discovered. Further to this, there was no indication that he had lit a fire at any time outside his tent, which had been located a short distance away from his body. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the police chief had been somewhat reluctant to discuss the matter with his wife upon his return home. But over the coming days, she managed to persuade him to share his experience with the rest of the staff at his office, to try and make sense of what he had seen. It was a decision which Greenhaw would immediately come to regret, as his description of the encounter was met with nothing but ridicule by his subordinates. Any hope that he and his wife may have harboured, that the Polaroid pictures in his possession may have alleviated this mocking, would be dashed as the story then spread into the wider community. Of the four photographs he had taken, one showed little more than a nondescript length of silver, reflecting the camera's flash back at the device. And of the individual depicted in the other three, there was no end of theories as to what he had seen none of which supported the idea that it was a genuine extraterrestrial visitor. Some speculated that the images showed a local youth, wearing a modified Halloween costume as part of a prank on the local police department. Others suggested that the individual was wearing a protective fire suit, and that the police chief himself was in on the stunt, in order to gain some degree of notoriety. Within months of the incident, Jeff Greenhaw's life would be turned upside down, with elements of the local community commencing a campaign of harassment against him. Initially, this included mocking and disrespectful messages being left on his truck, before the vehicle itself was vandalised beyond repair. His trailer home was then firebombed, with this act proving too much for his wife, who subsequently commenced divorce proceedings against him. Finally, Greenhaw was summoned to a public meeting of the town council, which was also attended by County Sheriff John McBride and the town mayor, Wade Tomlinson. In response to a motion demanding that the police chief resign, both men refused to publicly support Greenhaw, leaving him with no option but to hand in his resignation. A year to the day after his encounter with the bizarre metal entity, he came home to find that his garage had been broken into, with several items missing. Everything that had been taken somehow related to his alleged encounter with the metal man, whilst items of greater value had been left untouched. Amongst these were his service revolver and shotgun, which he had retained after his resignation as a police officer, as well as the four Polaroid images which he had taken on the evening in question but kept hidden away given how they had created such an adverse effect on his existence. In the years that followed, Jeff Greenhaw did agree to participate in media interviews about what had taken place, but never sought to profit financially from the event. Having retrained and started a new business as a carpenter, and with the furore surrounding the incident now long behind him, he went on to remarry and move on with his life. The Alabama Metal Man remains one of the most divisive alleged alien encounters in American history, 
evoking strong feelings from both believers and critics. Many commentators continue to assert that the incident must have been a prank, orchestrated by the young police chief for unknown motives. They point to the convenience of having the Polaroid camera with him at the time of the incident, and the fact that the alleged woman who contacted him had never been identified. Questions have also been asked as to why the police chief seemed happy to cooperate with journalists of local newspapers and media outlets, who were the eventual instigators of his resignation. One surprising factor that seems to support this side of the argument comes from the most unlikely of sources, the UFO monitoring network, MUFON. In the aftermath of the incident, Greenhaw had sent the four Polaroid images to the organisation in a bid to find out exactly who or what he had encountered. In a shattering move, these were then returned by the network, who expressed their belief that the incident was a hoax, and that what he had encountered was a prankster in a suit. And yet, it seems this rejection of Greenhaw's evidence by MUFON has also proven to be something of a double-edged sword, with others claiming their swift judgement in fact vindicates him. While sceptical of the source of the images, the MUFON analysts were clear that the Polaroids themselves had not been interfered with or adapted in any way prior to submission. They were also certain that the distances described by Greenhor at which he had taken the images matched the size and perspective of the Metal Man in each of the four pictures. Given that Greenhor never made any money from his report and lost his marriage and livelihood, it seems difficult to argue that he is guilty of orchestrating the incident, unless of course he wasn't anticipating such a vehement backlash. The encounter is itself notorious for its similarity to others very much like it, which involved what appeared to be robot entities near the scene of UFO sightings. Five years after the incident in Alabama, an almost identical figure was encountered by a member of the public near to an atomic energy site in Risley, Greater Manchester. The only difference was the respective heights of each being, with the one at Risley standing at over seven feet tall. Even so, that entity was able to incapacitate the vehicle being driven by the witness, producing beams of light from its eyes before then disappearing into the darkness. Years earlier in 1964, hunter Donald Shrum claimed to have been attacked by a group of odd-looking creatures which emerged from a flying saucer he had witnessed landing in Cisco Grove, California. Their number consisted of several small humanoid lifeforms and two much larger entities which appeared to be robotic. These metallic beings were able to render the hunter unconscious for short periods of time utilising an unknown gas which they were able to project from their mouths. Both of these encounters seem to suggest that perhaps Greenhall was fortunate in that the entity he encountered did not choose to engage with him. But what perhaps makes the case of the Alabama Metal Man so notorious is its apparent proximity both in terms of time and distance to a far more distressing event one which had been reported only six days prior, having allegedly taken place within the neighbouring state of Mississippi. An experience in which two men claimed to have encountered horrifying creatures and were subsequently taken aboard their extraterrestrial craft. An event that would become known as the Pascagoula Incident. Stay tuned for that story.